to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Lift up your eyes, clean out your ears, and remember, no matter who you're pulling or pushing for, or even if you don't care for any of them, remember, fill your minds with the truth of God. For we have been called to be ambassadors, ambassadors of the one true King, a King whose parables reminded us that our neighbor may look and think differently, but we still need to love them. A King who talked of power coming from weakness, a king who said that peacemakers are truly children of God. A king who turned the laws of the world on its head. A king who could have commanded his army of angels to wage war against his enemies, but instead gave himself to the cross. Our king showed us that changing the world has nothing to do with political power. So remember, because we are joint heirs with Christ, our power is not tied to money, fame, or politics. Our power comes from the creator of the universe, and he has given us the voice in this world, a voice to change the world. And our voice is strongest when God's voice speaks through us. Our voice is loudest when we are quiet before the Father. Our voice is the boldest when we humble ourselves to God. Our voice is the most influential when we swallow up all the hate in this world and speak forth with love. So do you really want to change the world? Do you? Do you really want to change the world? Then fill your hearts and minds with the truth of God because the kingdoms of earth will pass away, but God's kingdom, it's eternal. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's great to see everyone. I want to give a shout out to those in Gallup um, who are watching today as well, and for those in other parts of the building and those that are watching online right now. So when I was in college, I, uh, I traveled on a thing that was called Camp Team. Now, Bible colleges um, put a lot of weight into church camps as a, a major recruiting tool. Uh, and so I spent a summer going to church camps, and part of our prep was a week of orientation. And one of the things that we were told is that on the weekends, you're going to be staying with families and churches of the, uh, uh, in the areas of these church camps. And invariably, somebody is going to say, make yourself at home. And I can remember them saying, if somebody tells you to make yourself at home, don't you dare make yourself at home. <laughs> Because you need to remember who you're representing. You're representing Jesus and, and Dallas Christian College. Now, when I think of Peter's words to the churches of Asia in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, I think that kind of rings true. He says, Beloved, uh, I urge you as sojourners and exiles temporary residence, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage against your soul, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I think in a lot of ways what Peter is saying right here is don't make yourself at home and remember who it is that you're representing while you're here. And so one of the things that I, I think we need to do, in fact, Jim mentioned this a few weeks ago, is don't get cozy with the world. We need to remember that we are here temporarily. And, and one of the reasons why we don't cozy up to the world, one of the reasons why we don't make ourselves at home is that the world's just crazy. Okay, I, I, the world is just going nuts right now. In fact, I want to just give you a, a couple of pictures of, of our world right now, and I, 
dare I even bring in the last couple of weeks with the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, uh, and now the president having coronavirus. It's like, if this were a movie, you could not write it any better. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, and so, one of the things that I, I have as a heading in, on, on my notes is blind political loyalty. I, I remember growing up, um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I can remember people saying predominantly of Reagan that they loved certain things about him, but yet there were certain qualities that they didn't particularly care for. In adulthood, I can remember people saying, I, I like what Clinton's doing with the country, but there are these character issues that we have. Something's happened over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, where we're not thinking critically about our, the people that we support politically. There is this absolute blind loyalty, almost messianic-like, God-like, that, that we make these people infallible and we support them no matter what. And on the flip side, if they're not our guy or our woman in political spectrum, we vilify them. And part of that is in the political rhetoric of today. The political rhetoric of today is, dare I say, vile at times. Absolutely vile. Uh, a, a, a person who worked for a former administration this week said, well, if I acted like that, I hope somebody would shoot me. Speaking of another political person. Uh, we're having you know, situations today where we're calling people really vile things. If you actually, and I, I, this is not a political thing, if you type in Hitler on Google, it's going to autofill with Trump. I mean, we, we have this, this thing, we're calling people monsters, we're dehumanizing people. I actually got on one of the websites yesterday, news websites, and I was talking about the president having coronavirus, and I, I just read about, a, about 50 different comments. And of those 50 different comments, it was just hate back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Either I hope he's dead, or people that almost made him messianic-like. And so I think about in our culture today, there was actually a Groucho Marx song from 1932. Some of you might, might remember this, not that, not that you were around in 1932, but I don't know what they have to say. It makes no difference anyway. Whatever it is, I'm against it. No matter what it is or who commenced it, I'm against it. And, and that's kind of how we've started developing things in, in our world today. And now we have, on top of everything, what is cancel culture. There is no dialogue. There is no dialogue. I mean, absolutely no dialogue. If you disagree with me on any way, we can agree on 99 things, but if you disagree on that one out of 100, I'm going to cancel you out of my life. In fact, one of my questions that I have today is, who will not be canceled out of our culture? It is eventually going to devour itself because we are at a point where, again, we just cancel anybody who might have any kind of disagreement. So really, here's what it kind of looks like today. People are either angry, we got that? They're obsessed. Like, that's all they think about is the political stuff. They're online all the time trying to figure out what's going to happen. They're ingrained, and ingrained means that they've jumped both feet in, and they are completely in the political world, and it's their job to make sure everybody is changed through our political world. And there's another option, and I think a lot of people are getting here, apathetic. I think the one thing that I'm having to fight right now is in between anger and apathetic, where it just seems like either I don't care 
or it raises my blood pressure. And maybe there's a different path. And maybe, maybe there's a different path. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 kind of serve as a springboard where Peter begins to talk about various spheres of life where Christians are called to be different. We're called to be different, and, and one of those is in the government realm of life. In fact, I want to look at at 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want to look at verses 13 through 17 very quickly here today. But as we get into this, one of the things that I do want to say is Peter does not talk about the world as it should be. He talks to us on how to function in the world as it is. We spend so much of our time talking about what the world should be. Now, with that, I'm not telling us not to vote. I'm not telling us not to be uh, active in, in the political world. I, I'm also not going to talk about the what ifs or the but what about, because Peter doesn't talk about the what about. I just want to talk about what Peter is telling Christians in the ancient world in an imperfect political society. So let's look at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as the supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and, and, and praise those who do good. Now, just want to kind of lock in real quick into the word submit here today. It's a command of Scripture for us to submit to our governing authorities. Now, again, there's always that, but what about this situation? What about this situation? Peter doesn't get into this. He simply tells us to submit. It's not an option. Now, now with this, one of the things that we often do is we have to oftentimes have a hard time with the word submission. And, and I actually read somebody this week who said that submission is, is a pillar of, of healthy societies. And whether we know it or not, it, it actually is. Now, as we talk about submission, it's a military term. And this military term was, it was really meant to arrange yourself under. That was the, the technical definition, to arrange yourself under another person. So basically, to submit is to yield to the direction and leadership of another, whether mandatory or obligatory. You see, there's sometimes we don't have an option, and sometimes we, we use that as, as an option where it's the best thing for us to do. Scripture tells us to submit to one another, to yield to another person, to make them more important than ourselves. Now, it says first to submit, but I want you to understand the word order here. If you could go back to verse 13, it says, be subject to for the Lord's sake. It's not because somebody deserves it. This is my obligation to the Lord. So whether the, the, the emperor, we would call that the, the, the national government, or the governors. Now, the governors were sent with Roman soldiers into Roman territories, and their job was to keep the peace. I was listening to a book this week that actually suggested that there was one Roman soldier uh, for every 100 people with a specific goal of keeping peace in the world. That's what it was actually meant to be. So, for the Lord's sake, I submit to whether it's the national, whether it's the, the, the national authorities, or whether it be state and local authorities. But there is an end game. And, and this end game is understanding that there's a different path for us to take. There's a different path. You see, submission is completely different than what most people are in the world. Right now, there are two kinds of people in America. There are people who hate the government and want to rebel against it, right? Or there are people who are just blindly loyal, almost religiously loyal to the government. Now, we're not called to be religiously loyal. We're not called to rebel. We're called to submit. We're called to honor. We're, 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 we're called to be different, kind of in that middle space where no one 
else wants to be. But again, the end game. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. For this is the will of God. That's a big one. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. I, I want to go back to verse 15. This is the will of God. I mean, Peter has to remind them, listen, it's not about rebelling and, and hating the government, and sometimes, oh, that's really easy to do. It, it's not about being blindly loyal to the government. It's, a, it's about filling that middle space. But this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Did you catch that? I'm going to say it like this. Live in a way as to silence slander. Live in such a way that no matter what people try to say against us, it's like we have Teflon lives that they end up just having to, to, to be silent about us because there's nothing negative that they can say. And if you get to verse 17, there is kind of what Peter, I think, fills in the blank of, here's how we silence the slander. Here's how we silence the, even though they say evil against you sort of statement. Look at verse 17. I love this. Honor everyone. Treat everyone with value. Okay, did, did you catch this? Everyone with value. In our world that we have kind of a spotlight on racism today, treat everyone the same. In a world where we try to, to, to vilify and, and even use terms of uh, like animals and monsters and different things like that, of people that we don't agree with, treat everyone with value. That's, to me, a, a huge thing. So honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. The brotherhood is, in other words, what he is saying is, as a church, as a local body, love one another and love one another well. In fact, it was Jesus who said, that they will know that you are, belong to me, not because of the sign out in front of your building, but the way that you love one another. In fact, the way we treat one another in the church may be one of the, the more uh, evangelistic things that we can do to the world and for the world. And so we have this, and then we get into, uh, after love the brotherhood, it goes on to say this, fear God. Live to please God. Live to know that He is the supreme authority that we will answer to at the end of the age. And finally, honor the emperor. Hold him with great value, but know that he is not God. Know that he's imperfect, that he is fallible, but seek to honor him by the way that you act. And then we get in understanding that the sphere of government isn't the only place. The sphere of government isn't the only place that we are subject to. We're going to get into verse 18. 18 says this, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to, to the good and, and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit uh, is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this, gracious thing, uh, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, I don't know necessarily what to do with this. Because, again, Peter is speaking to the world as it is, not as it should be. 
And I, I, I would have loved for Peter to have said, listen, when there's slavery in the world, rise up against it. And, and, and we can see Christians throughout history who have risen up against slavery, and rightfully so. When we have a voice that we can defend the defenseless, we should do that. And Peter doesn't get into that, but he says, listen, if you're a slave, now 50 to 80 percent of the Roman world is thought to have been slaves. 50 to 80 percent were thought to be slaves. That is an astronomical number. Now, many slaves were able to own homes and land and were able to move about freely. But there were, and, and I think there were people that were treated well, but there were taskmasters. There were owners of slaves who were not kind to their slaves. And probably the best way for me to kind of get, make a cultural comparison is this speaks into how we should live as employees. Now, I'm just going to tell you the number one thing that I hear from people about their jobs is how they are a victim. That's, that's a big thing today. In fact, the number one ethic in our culture today is to be a victim. But people always complain, my boss is a jerk, I'm underpaid, they don't value me, all these different things. That's the number one thing that I hear. Now, I'm just going to tell you, there is no perfect job, nor is there a perfect boss. And I'm a boss. And, and so I can understand, in fact, I, I sometimes, <laughs> I, I've told my kids when they're complaining about their bosses, I'm saying, listen, I'm a boss and probably sometimes I have people complaining about me. It's not the easiest thing to do. But I think if Peter is, is, is talking to, to the church and telling the church what to do and, and how to operate in this imperfect world, I think one of the, the, the ways that he is telling them is, is keep this in mind. Don't be a victim and work hard. I, if, if I could tell anybody, if, looking at this particular passage here, there's a couple of things that I would pull out. One is, don't be a victim. Don't complain. Don't just, it, it's, it, sometimes it is your fault. Really. It's not your spouse's fault. It's not your job, or your, your, your boss's fault. It, it's not the government's fault. Sometimes it's your fault, so stop being a victim. And go to your job and work hard. At the end, I, you know, I'll, I'll even just say this, not in my notes, unsolicited, you get a little extra because I'm getting a little hot right now. <laughs> Sometimes we have too much energy and too much time on our hands because we're not working hard. And sometimes we need to come home at the end of the day and be so tired that we don't have time to get online and see how the world is falling apart. We just need to be a solution and not a problem. So work hard. Work very hard. So that at the end of the day, you sleep well. But I'm also going to say this. Be a missionary in your workplace. We get to be Jesus in our workplaces. And I don't know whether you know this or not. Your job outside of your home is probably the place that you spend most of your, most of your time. And when you work hard and when you're good and you're different, you're going to stand out. And you have a chance to be a missionary where you are. So with this in mind... Um, as I've kind of looked at our, our, our role in, with government and our role in employment, I, I want to say it like this. Be distinctly good and distinctly different. And you're probably saying, well, isn't distinctly and different kind of the same thing? So probably, yeah, but I'm going to explain it here in a moment. Here's what I mean by being distinctively good. There's, a, uh, there's a, probably a lot of ways that the world could look at us and say, you are good. 
In fact, there is a term that I, uh, I use uh, some, Tim, or Jim and I talk about this quite a bit. It's called moral therapeutic deism. Moral therapeutic deism is I'm good and I sleep better at night. I'm good because I pay my taxes. I'm good because I go to church. I'm good because I'm checking all the boxes to say that I am good. It's kind of like the Boy Scout thing. You do your good deed for the day, right? So that's moral therapeutic deism. But I'm going to say our good as followers of Jesus will look completely different than the good of the world. It's not good to be seen. It's not good with selfish motives. It's, it's not good when everyone else is looking. It's not being good at our jobs when the boss is around, but otherwise being a slacker. It's distinctively good in that there's a transformation that happens because the Spirit of God through Jesus is living inside of us and causes change to happen in our lives. That when people say they're good but they're different, they're, they can't quite put their finger on it, but they know that there's something there. And so good is, is not necessarily joining in with what everyone else says is good. Right now, there's, there's variations of what people say are, are good, and maybe good is saying nothing right now when everybody else is jumping up and down, screaming at the top of their lungs to be heard. It's also distinctly different. Now, I'm just going to share this, folks. <laughs> We're weird. <laughs> Whether we know it or not, people look at us Christians as we're weird. I mean, we're weird. They don't get what we do. They don't get baptism. They don't get why we would base our lives on an ancient book when there's so much other learning to be done and to form our lives around. They, they don't get why we, we are generous with our money and our time, and they don't get this whole thing of communion. And There's just so many things that the world just looks at us as weird. And again, we don't have to make it weirder to them. I, I had a conversation this week, and it was a brief conversation with a gentleman just popped in. And, and, and you know, I, I'm just going to say part of, the, part of being distinctly different as Christians is being able to be normal. And especially being around, normal around people who are not Christians, that, that we don't repel them from Jesus. The guy came in and said, isn't it just a glorious day? I'm like, slow down, Skippy. Seriously. Isn't God up to something big? I don't know. But when people act like that, that's just weird. And so our distinctly different needs to be, I'm, I'll say it like this, that we're so good that people say, I can't put my finger on it. But a guy looks at a Christian man and the way he carries himself and says, there's something, there's something good about him, but I want to sit down and have a beer with him because there's just something about him. That there's a normalcy there's a calm, there's a peace. That different, I can't tell you what it is, but it's just different. So what do we do with this? Uh, I, I want to share. I believe that we need to look to Jesus. Okay? That if, if we really want to own this, we've got to look to Jesus. In fact, I, I want to read some verses here today that Peter actually shares out of the Old Testament. He actually shares out of Isaiah 53. And this is going to be the hardest thing for us to do. He says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Leaving you an, an example so you might follow in his steps. Listen, the longer we, look, we, we follow Jesus, the more we should look like him. 
And our different and our good needs to point people to Jesus. Period. And notice what Peter goes on to say. He committed no sin, neither was uh, deceit found in his mouth. He was reviled, and he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the judges, uh, to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in, in, in his body on a tree that that we might die uh, to sin and live to, to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I find it interesting that when Peter says we have an example to follow in Jesus, he points to a passage in the Old Testament that refers to Jesus being silent. Not arguing, not fighting back, not combative, when he could have called 10,000 angels down. He was silent. I don't know what to do with that other than to say sometimes in our world, it's better for people to see us as different and good than for us have to announce it from the rooftops that we are. One other way that I think we can own this today. Don't grow weary of doing good. Don't grow weary. In fact, it says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So, one of the joys of ministry right now, in fact, I've said this for the last four years, is getting to do life with Jim Buchelman. And I can't tell you how many hours a week we spend just in conversation in my office or his office. And one of the things that we expressed this week, now this was before President Trump came down with COVID, so um, let's just exponentially put this down on there, but we both said how weary we are right now. How tired we are of fighting the fight. And I talk to a lot of people, and right now one of the things that I'm hearing from people is they're tired. They're tired. They're tired of the news. They're tired of every time we turn around something else. We're weary. I get it. But let us never, ever tire of looking to Jesus and doing the good that he has called us to do. We join me in prayer. Father in heaven, I am um, I confess that sometimes it is so hard not to be weary. This world right now is not an easy place to live. It's not supposed to be. You've called us to another, another place. So, Father, right now I pray that with all the craziness in the world that we don't join in, but we're different. And, Father, I pray that we don't grow weary to where we just don't want to do good anymore. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.